Hi, this is uh, Michael Smith for uh, Nevada Trails. I have a very special two-part show for you, and it's on uh, wild horses. It is so special, I brought in uh, two guests to go ahead and, and host the show. They are Willis Lamb and Lacey J. Dalton. Enjoy the show. I'm Lacey J. Dalton. I'm the co-founder and president of Let Em Run Foundation, which is an organization here in Nevada for the protection and preservation of wild horses. And I'm Willis Lamb. I'm president of Least Resistance Training Concepts. We're wild horse mentors, and we also do volunteer work out on the range with the wild horses. Hands on. Hands on. And what are we going to talk about today, Willis? Tonight, we're going to talk, talk about, about horse wars. wars. Why are we at war, and who are we at war with, Willis? Tell us. Well, we're at war basically with the Nevada Department of Agriculture. We have a new director who's taken it upon himself to remove virtually the entire herd of the Virginia Range wild horses. And that's arguably the largest contiguous wild, hoard, wild horse herd left in America. Willis, that sounds, uh, that sounds pretty serious. Um, I think we need to talk, I think the first thing we need to talk about are the lies. We have got some lies. Lie number one. Tell us about lie number one. Lie number one. Mr. Les Brents went to the Interim Finance Committee and anybody that has a newspaper or watches Excuse television. Excuse me just a second. Yeah. Who is Mr. Les Brents? The Director of Agriculture that Governor Givens recently appointed. New guy. New guy. And he's come in. Um, and. Nevada, as we all know, is suffering from a real serious budget crunch, hundreds of millions of dollars. He went to the Interim Finance Committee, and line number one was that he complained that the state could no longer afford to feed the wild horses on the Virginia Range. Oh. Well, Tell me what the lie. <laughs> no. Okay, the, the, the statement is, we at the Nevada Department of Agriculture can no longer afford to feed the wild horses on the range. They don't feed the wild horses, and they, they never have fed the wild horses. The volunteer groups, mainly the Virginia Range Wildlife Protection Association and some of the other groups, come up with emergency feed if we have a big blizzard or horses get landlocked or if they need to be diverted from developed areas. The state hadn't paid a dime. So what's this problem about feeding wild horses? All right. Let's, let's deal with lie number two. The horses are starving on the Virginia Range. Oh. Yeah, oh boy. Crisis, crisis. The sky is falling. Chicken Little Esperance. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably over the top. Now that's good. No, no, I think Chicken Little Esperance is a real good name for this guy. All right, well, the horses are starving, and uh, all you got to do is just drive the Virginia Range or take a walk, and you'll see that the horse herd is actually pretty darn healthy. In fact, some of the mares might even be considered slightly overweight. Um, you know, you can walk down through downtown Carson City and you'll find an occasional person that looks pretty skinny. And the same thing uh, applies to the wild horses. The very old wild horses tend to lose some weight before they die. And that's just part of the natural life cycle. But if you look at the herd as a whole, it's pretty robust. In fact, you know, they're saying they're starving to death. At the same time, there's a population problem. You just can't make the math work with these guys. Yeah. All right. Thank you. 
All right, let's talk about, uh, let's move along and talk about lie number three. <laughs> lie number three, yeah. The horses have eaten everything up on the range. There's no forage left. Um, you know, we're already into fire season. <laughs> it's, it's like the, the grass out there is incredible. You know, if we'd been in the end of back-to-back -back drought years, you know, that argument might have flown. But just take a drive out. In, around the range or on some of our highways, you know, it may not be quite as green as Ireland, but it's pretty darn green out there, and there's a lot of grass. Yeah, I, I actually uh, I believe I heard that there were five varieties of native grasses, and they were so plentiful that if we don't allow these wild horses to graze it, this grass down, we are liable, like we a few years ago when they took the horses off Red Rock, yeah, big fire. have a catastrophic fire. Is this, uh, is this true? Well, I can buy that. I'm retired from the fire service. And, you know, Carson City now, the taxpayers are paying money to rent sheep to graze the grass down. Um, there is a letter on file from the old uh, f original fire department up there in the Virginia Highlands requesting that a reasonable number of horses be maintained because they did understand that the, the flash fuels, these dry grasses that just the, the fire travels so fast, the horses are a significant um, mitigator of that fire threat. And is it true that these horses are one of the few ungulates that can actually eat the dried grasses? They like the dried grass. Um, later on in, in the next segment, uh, Craig Downer, who's a wildlife ecologist, can explain all of that. I'm, I don't consider myself, a, you know, a, an expert, but they certainly do seem to like those grasses. That's what they eat, um, and they go around and they, they browse off. And if you look out, actually, I was out on the range today, where on the side of the fence where the horses are, um, there's sporadic grass. The cheat grass seems to be down. Um, cheat grass is what scares everybody. On the side of the fence where there's no horses, the perennial native grasses don't seem to be that much more plentiful, but there's a whole carpet of flammable cheat grass. And that's a significant issue if you happen to be downwind of the fire. I just got, I just had an evacuation call <laughs> yeah, at my I house. That. I live in the highlands, you know, and I see, um, I see these starving horses <laughs> they look like rabbits they're so fat and uh we we up there in the highlands appreciate and we have learned from uh the settlers who always appreciated the fact that the wild horses ate down these grasses and actually you know in historical records um actually stated that this was a very good thing and that the horses should be allowed to to do this because they had such catastrophic fires. Virginia City must have burned seven times, you know. <laughs> I know. And I live I live just a little yeah. way down yeah. from yeah. it, you know. Yeah. It's scary to see that fire coming up towards right. your house. I don't want to see that. Right. Uh, and I do want to see wild horses, and so do most of my neighbors. Well, you know, it, it, the place does look better if it's not a burned-off moonscape. And, um, <laughs> you know, I don't no. think we're going to be able to turn a bunch of sheeps and goats loose in the Virginia Highlands, you know. So, um, you know, and the horses do play a part. It... I want to segue here for a second. That doesn't mean that the residents shouldn't be fire conscious, you know, and exactly, and, you know, abate weeds around their, their property and around their houses and so forth. But, you know, every little help you can get in a bad fire season and, hey, we're a cyclical desert here. We get a little bit of snow and rain in the wintertime and then Katie bar the door come the summertime. So, yeah, that's a big deal. And I think that it shouldn't be overlooked which obviously we haven't overlooked it. <laughs> we haven't, and, and, and please tell us, you, you know, you do a couple of things around the county. I know, how long did you work for uh, Contra Costa Fire Department? I mean, you well, are I, an experienced. I was, I was a firefighter in both urban and, and rural setting for almost 30 years, you know. So, Thanks, Willis. Um, and we've seen, well, and that's also kind of our, the way we look at the horse situation, you know, in, in the fire service, especially if you're a fire officer, you have to look at facts and probabilities. You know, we, <laughs> We never found a, a politician that could talk a fire out. <laughs> you know, we had to deal with reality. And that's kind of our perspective with this horse issue. You know, you can't make up stuff and then have reality come around to, to what you fabricate. You know, we have to deal with the real world. The real world is there are horses out there, and they do need to be managed. The real world is they're not starving to death. The real world is the state isn't paying to feed them out there. Um, the real world is that the range is actually pretty healthy, and the real world is that there are things we can do to improve the range, to improve the health of the horses, to improve the plant colonies, to mitigate erosion. Um, but nobody wants to talk about that if they can have a crisis and rip all the horses off. Well, and, and isn't also um, the 
Well, let's deal, first of all, let's deal with lie number four. Oh, lie number four. I know oh. this sounds dramatic, but it's so ridiculous. It's like we're on a soap opera. It's lies, lies, <laughs> lies. Oh, uh, hook line for a new song for Lacey's next I, album. Well, I'm, I'm afraid it's already been taken. J.J. <laughs> Kale. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> lies, <laughs> lies, lies, lies. Okay, well, you know. He we, obviously ran into these guys before we must did. have. <laughs> you know, this is from Mark Amaday, who's a Nevada state senator. You know, this is, he says, according to Edward Foster, public information officer of the Department of Agriculture. The purpose of the management program is to maintain a healthy and sustainable horse population in the Virginia range, which was estimated in 2000 to be 500 and 600 horses. The estimate on habitat capacity was calculated after a comprehensive habitat capacity analysis. Mr. Foster estimates the current herd population in the Virginia range at 1,200 horses. Um, they talk about this study and that the appropriate number of horses on the range in its current condition is 350 to 400 animals. Now, <laughs> Mr. Amaday, who's the attorney for developers that want to develop the horse range, um, oh! <laughs> kind of forgets that the study, mark, mark, mark. which we have here, it was for 85,130 acres out of what Mr. Amaday says is a 440,000 acre horse range. So if... Um, and if you look at the table, it's about... Do the math. Do the math. You're so good at this. Look at the table. It's about 550 horses should be sustainable in that study area, which is about 20% of the 440,000 acres. Well, we'll take that 440,000 acres and we'll cut it in half because there's some houses and some developments and we don't need horses in downtown Virginia City or downtown Dayton. That's still only about 40% of the horse range, which means that if you take the study figures by real scientists from the university, um, the range can support about 1,200 or more horses. There's about 1,200 or more horses on the range, which means we're about right. We hope. Yeah, and we, we're not sure even yet. We're going to go up in the air real how, soon. How long do you think it's been since the Department of Agriculture has actually done a horse count to know how many horses are actually well, out Well, they there? claim they've counted horses, but we're... You know, we need to count where there's somebody from the Department of Agriculture, somebody from the press, and somebody from the Wild Horse Advocacy Camp to go up there and when the, when the helicopter lands, they all three agree on the numbers. Then we know we've got good numbers. But, How but important is that, Willis? Well, I think it's real important. I mean, praxin, uh, praxin probabilities. <laughs> facts and probabilities. Um, easy for you to say. Easy for me to say. Yeah, you need the facts and you need to know you know, how many horses are actually out there, and you need to know how many acres uh, of per, uh, grazable land there are still available to the horses, and you need to know how many horses can be supported per acre, along with the other wildlife and animals that are out there. But let's just say hypothetically there are around 1,200 animals. That's not a crisis. That's about right. It doesn't mean that we don't need to keep an eye on things. They're working on birth control and other ways to, to control horse populations. You know, uh, there are some horses that will be removed because they're taught by humans to be nuisance bears. You know, we don't have a crisis. We don't have to throw a lot of tax money at it. We just have to use our brains and base the decisions on facts and probabilities. I'm so glad that we have uh, Dr. Craig Downer here with us who is probably one of the finest uh, experts uh, on equine science that, that we have. Well, he and is a world-recognized uh, wildlife ecologist. In, uh, I mean, he dis discovered what they thought was an extinct species of, of taper in South America. I mean, he's done a lot taper of stuff. Taper related to the horse. Well, taper <laughs> is sort of. I think their grazing habits and so forth and, and how they process plants are very similar. But, you know, that's something that... that Craig Downer can explain later on when he comes on the next segment of this show, you know, but... You Tune know. in, because this is, you're going to love hearing <laughs> the real facts. Yeah. We're, you know, we're, we're not scientists, mm -hmm. but we do, uh, we've uh, been around Craig long enough to... Uh, we have I friends think, that are scientists. We have friends who are scientists who really know what they're talking about. And we about. also like to find it in writing or, or find it in a report or have it recorded on television um, before we make a claim about what's been said or what's been done or what the facts are, you know. I, I want to know something. Uh, this would actually be lie number five. Oh, and a fifth I want to. There is. We didn't talk about a fifth lie, but there is a fifth lie. I want to know why the state, which had a free birth control program for the Comstock Wild Horses, arbitrarily <sighs> dropped that birth control program, a program that could have made sure that we never had more horses than we have right yeah. now. Can you please tell me why the state would do something like that and what the lies are 
first of all, I want to know, I read in the paper that this stuff is only good for deer and not for horses. <laughs> okay. Well, here's, here's what's going on. The University of Nevada, uh, Reno, has a, a, a trial program on a birth control, temporary birth control for horses called GNRH. And, they, and this is compassionate, right? This yeah, is just well, a shot we yeah, give It's them. a shot, and it, and it keeps the mares from conceiving for, I don't know, maybe two, three, four years. That's what the study's all about. Um, and what we had going on here was the, they had some test mares in the state corrals, and they had some, um, an area called uh, a TRW where they studied some mares in the field. And they also immunocontraceptively vaccinated a number of other mares that just went out on the range. Now, the thing is that the wild horse groups were watching the horses that went out because we were curious about this. We wanted to make sure that they weren't like going to grow a second head or it was going to disrupt <laughs> their social fabric. And what See we've seen, the two-headed horse. Yeah, and, and what we've seen so far is it, it's very encouraging. Now, it's not the be-all, end-all to horse management, but it buys everybody some time, and it kind of helps uh, curtail the population bump in a real good year where we have a lot of grass. and, the, and Like ordinary. this year. Yeah, like this year. So anyway, make a long story short, um, you have to have follow-up for the for the pharmaceutical companies to give you free drugs to test in a trial. In other words, you need to have people who are actually out there monitoring right. these horses to make sure right. that they're okay right. while you are, and that's right. how, and that's the, where you get the free that's, yeah, pharmaceuticals. Yeah, and that's the feedback. I mean, the whole idea is it's a trial. It's not just turning horses loose that have been, been vaccinated. Um, and we proposed last year a consortium. Now, who is we? You the, say the we. Well, we're running out of time, so it's okay. just a consortium of wild horse groups in the area and some other groups that support it. Our group, Virginia Range Wildlife Protection Association, your group was involved, Lifesavers Wild Horse Rescue and, uh, and Wild Horses in Need. You know, we would provide the follow-up, get volunteers trained, and we'd even cover some of the costs or their expenses to go out so that these things could be documented and the study could continue. Um, anyway, it never happened. There's not really a study out on the range, and so now they're going to study deer. Why, why did it not happen? Why did the Department of Agriculture not take advantage of the offer of the Alliance of Horse Groups to monitor the horses so that they could continue the birth control problem? Was because the director of the Department of Agriculture at the time that was following that logical thread gave up her hands and left, or threw up her hands and left, and the director that came in now, I don't, I don't think he wants to see any solution that doesn't point toward a crisis and rip a bunch of horses off the range. And get a bunch of money from interim finance when they are right. cutting programs. From the taxpayer. Interim from the finance tax is our pocket. Right. Know. From the taxpayer while they are cutting programs for the disabled, the elderly, children, and education right. to manufacture a crisis like this that does not exist, to go before a committee right. to ask for money. This, in my opinion is absolutely unrighteous. It, it is, is the difference between right and wrong. Absolutely. You know what? And that's that's one thing I actually had a fellow from Louisiana ask around town till he found my house and he came over and he says, you know, I got to tell you, you know, I do like horses. I've adopted some wild horses and so forth, but this isn't about horses. This is about right and wrong. And I said, well, you know, basically it is, you know, the, we're, we're trying to hold off the, you know, the speculators and the, and the, the range rats, you know, and, and, Fight for something that, that stands for Nevada. These are Nevada's horses. The, Vir the Virginia Range horses are truly Nevada's horses. Now, what is Nevada? The people of Nevada. Look at your quarter, and, and that'll give you a good idea. The new the wild horse quarter. Yeah, that's what the people are looking for. But here's the deal. Now they're saying, well, we're not going to gather up all the horses. We're going to have a study. Of course, you know and I know, and we don't have time to talk about it. They tried to do an in run on the study. Um, and now they're saying, well, they're gonna, nothing's going to happen for six months. At the same time, we're still documenting things in writing that are coming out of the department that are patently untrue. So my point is, and I think your point is, we can't trust these guys right now. They we, have no credibility. Well, they really don't. And they have lied, 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 lies, <laughs> lies, lies. How do you deal with someone? And, and, the, and I have a point to make, Willis. Okay. They've been trying to do a horse management program for 30 <laughs> years. Every couple of years, we have to fight with them to try to keep these horses alive. I'm tired of the fight. Well, you know what? And we have, we work with all kinds of different agencies, as you know, and we don't always agree with the policies of all those agencies, but if their decisions are based on some kind of fact, then we have something to work with. And then we can usually distill things down to, to some sort of reasonable plan that everybody can accept. When, when all bets are off, there's nothing to go on. Well, here's my suggestion. 
If you don't like all the, the, the horse manure that's coming out of the Department of Agriculture, you need to call Governor Gibbons and just say, you're not buying the lies. You're not buying the lies. Protect the Virginia range wild horses and manage that range based on science, facts, and probabilities. And the uh, truth. The truth. The truth. The truth let's will set them the, free. Let's try <laughs> oh, Yeah. All right. But i got to give them the governor's office number. Please you, do, you, you Willis. Call, here's and, here's and the governor's up, number. Don't beat up the ladies in the office. They're really nice. Yeah, they are phone. really great. They didn't create this problem, but, and they will take your information. You can give the governor hell. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. And the number is 775-684-5670. And we One all, more time, Willis. Sounds like an infomercial. 775-684-5670. Okay. Now, Call if that, him. If that wasn't dramatic enough, you can also log on to the Horse Wars news blog where all the stuff that comes out is basically... Blow down, by blow. Blow by minute blow. Minute by minute. Round by round. And, uh, you know, it's, it's exposed using source documents, newspaper articles actual photographs from the range, you know, and things of that nature. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to be the reality show in this whole thing. And the way to find that is easiest is to go to either letemrun.com, that's L-E-T-E-M-R-U-N.com, or kbrhorse.net. If you go to either one of those sites, just click on the Horse Wars banner, and it'll get you to the day-by-day, blow-by-blow, round-by-round uh, fracas that we found ourselves in, and then we're not going to quit till we win. That's right. We're in this for the long haul. And for the horses. We you can shoot us <laughs> before we're going to well, let these horses die. Well, shoot us first, die. please. No. <laughs> and you can stand on it. <laughs> yeah, you can stand on it. Line out in the rugged peaks South of the Oregon border North of Leonard Creek When high up on the rim rocks A shadow crossed the sun Down a sagebrush covered draw Came a Mustang on the run The pounding of his hoof beats Shook the chilly air Blowing hot breath from his nostrils And his eyes was white and scared He was running like the devil was tangled in his mane In the distance came the beating of a helicopter blade There was magic in the muscle and strength in every line Face of western history going back to Spanish times Conquistadors and cowboys and the legendary chiefs Shine Sioux and Kyle reflected in that beast Helicopter cleared the ridge line we knew that horse was done In the window sat a shooter With a tranquilizer gun One hundred yards from closing But we missed one small detail Sure the helicopter had the speed But the Mustang knew the trail He was hell-bent down the hillside Where the canyon walls were steep Racing for the shelter of a stand of aspen trees And there was thirty feet between them When the shooter fired his dart but the Mustang made the thicket and the needle missed its mark And there was magic in the muscle and strength in every line Face of Western history going back to Spanish times Conquistadors and cowboys and the legendary chiefs Cheyenne, Sue, and Kyle reflected in that beast Me and Wade speculated on the drama that had played While the silence rushed to fall back Opinion and the sage, perhaps as long as there are Mustangs out there running free, the wild left in the wild west won't become a memory.
It's a hand me down, hand me down, hand dead to me by my grandmother's grandma and her family. A couple of verses of sweet melody sing all our babies to sleep. Singing la 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 la. When it's dream time, my darling, I'll turn off the lights. You close your sleepy blue eyes, and like my mother before me, I'll sing you to sleep to the wild pony lullaby. See 'em dancing and prancing and whirling around. Behind your closed eyes, it's the dream world you find when you follow the sound of the wild pony lullaby. No one knows where it came from. But I'd like to believe that the angels were listening one dark winter's eve to a cold westbound wagon and the small baby's cries that they sent this old song to relieve, singing la 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 la. La 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 la. It's a hand me down, hand me down, handed to me.